players in MLB history to enter the league as a 19-year-old and finish as a 40-year-old. In his 22 seasons, he had the chance to shine for eight teams, and man, did he rake. But this is one of the more interesting cases on the ballot, considering Sheffield did admit to using steroids as he was caught up in the Balco scandal, but only said he used them before and during the 2002 season. But was that the only time that he ever did steroids? I'm not really sure. As from 2003 to 2005, he finished second, third, and eighth in MVP voting from his age 34 to age 36 season. He finished top three in MVP voting only one other time as a 23-year-old. But here's what we do know. Sheffield was one of the best power and speed combinations the game has ever seen. Not only did he pass the 500 home run threshold with 509, but he also stole 253 bases. Only Barry Bonds, Alex Rodriguez, and Willie Mays have passed those thresholds of 500 home runs and 250 stolen bases. I'll say that again. Only Barry Bonds, A-Rod, Willie Mays, and Gary Sheffield have hit at least 500 home runs and stole 250 bases. He has a higher walk rate than a K rate for his career. He hit almost 300 for his career. He has a 141 WRC plus. He's a nine-time All-Star. And to wrap it all up, he's a World Series champion in 1997. If you consider any of the steroid guys for the Hall of Fame, Sheffield needs to be on your list, and he's certainly on mine. Yeah, I Gary Sheffield, he was walking more than striking out before it was cool, before really, really anybody placed stocked in or placed stock in that. With Sheffield, I find it funny because he admit to doing them in the 2002 season. Yeah? yeah. Yes. So from 1999 to 2005, argument is totally there that 2002 was his worst year. It's weird, right? I if you're going to do them, go all out. <laughs> that's what I was just like. Are you sure? Like, are you sure that's the only season? And it was funny. Guess when? Guess who he's working out with in that season? Um, where was like he? Wild guess. He was with the Dodgers in that season. No, he was with Atlanta. Uh, no, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a teammate of his. It wasn't a teammate. Was it Ken Seiko? It was Barry Bonds. Like, that was Bonds. Okay, like, yeah, fair. Right, fair. I just, it, it's like he was fantastic, but then some of his best seasons came from 2003 to 2005 as a 34 to 36 year old. I have, I, we normally don't see a lot of primes in the mid 30s. But you know what's always sticks with me about Gary Sheffield when we talk about moments, like moments that people remember? He might have the most recognizable batting stance in the history of the game. The wobble of the wrists. That might be more famous than his actual name, if you think about I it. I think so. Absolutely. Right? Well, I mean, doing you've, it got, on YouTube. you've got that. You've got, so I'm thinking batting stances, right? And batting stance guy, we got to get batting stance guy on here at some point. But, yeah. you know, Griffey pushing it off the shoulder. I'm thinking Ichiro extending and, you know, pulling up the sleeve, right? Um, I mean, who else ahead of Sheffield? Ichiro. Ichiro Griffey. Griffey. Weird one, but Kevin Euclid. Everybody had a Kevin Everyone Euclid knows impression. Kevin Euclid. The Greek god of walks. I'm trying to think of more ones that everyone. No, nah, I wouldn't put Pujols in that. No, but Pujols was very imitatable. Very imitated. Also, who does Sheffield go in as if he were to make it? Because you play with if, the Marlins for six years, the Dodgers for four, the Brewers for four, the Yankees for three, the Braves for two, the Padres for two, the Tigers for two, and the Mets for one. I think a Marlin or a Dodger, I'd assume Marlin. Right, it has to be the Marlins. Let's. It has to be. But, I mean, he, as a Dodger, slash 312, 424 OBP, 573 slugging, hit 120 nine home runs in four seasons versus 122 with the Marlins in six seasons. Yeah. But, and he only played 32 more games with the Marlins. 
only played 32 more games with the Marlins. But that's uh, that's the thing. In the beginning of his career, he wasn't nearly as prolific as he was moving into his 30s. But I mean, in his 20s, he was still a four-time All-Star, finished top six in MVP voting twice and came away with two silver sluggers. But it was really what elongated his career was in his 30s. Like, for example, as a as a 35-year-old with the Yankees in 2004, I actually remember this season very well, 290, 393, 534 slugging, 36 bombs, 121 RBIs with a 927 OPS. And I think his overall war would be higher because his war is not that high. He wasn't that great of a defender, but then again, this is right field where, you know, the defense Dude. isn't as – I mean, he's a prolific hitter. He should be in the Hall of Fame. His 162 game average was a minus 1.7 war defensively. Yeah. D-war. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we're talking about three or four actually. Kent, Kent was average. Kent was like a, a career zero war guy defensively. Like, I mean, Sammy Sosa, Manny Ramirez, and Gary Sheffield all were like negative 30 guys in terms of defensive war. But they were much career. more prolific offensively than Jeff. Kent. Yeah. Yeah, no, I it's mean, just like when the, you compare Jeff Kent to other second basemen, you say, wow, he was incredibly right. prolific. But that's I mean, that's not exactly where we're going with here. Like, oh, like he's Rogers. Like, also, you look at like Rogers Hornsby's numbers. I know we're getting off track, but like, oh, my God. Yeah, but good. like I was, know, I know they were soft. It was softballs. I get it. I hate the I hate the era conversation because I'll 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 say this again. And I don't know if I've actually mentioned this on the podcast but I've mentioned it in live streams and on, on our TikTok and on our Instagram and on my Twitter at Peter Apple 23, by the way, go check me out. Nice plug. Nice yeah. plug. But how do we contextualize era? For example, Babe Ruth, Bill Russell. I get the Babe Ruth would hit 140 in today's game. Bill Russell would be Tyson Chandler in today's game. And I'm like, all right. So are you just taking Babe Ruth and Bill Russell with no training, no real sense of how the diet works, not as good of a sense of, of just training in the game in general, no TV, no social media, no connections, no, no IMG academies. And then you just place them in today's game or do they get to be born in the same time period? Do they get to grow up? And then maybe we'd get to see their talent. I think it's a stupid argument. So I see how good were you in your era and the best players in their era, I rank highly in. That's why I'm in the boat that Babe Ruth is the greatest player of all time. And that's not even Yankee bias. Let's talk about WRC plus. That is the best stat to help contextualize across era. You know, who's number one in WRC plus Babe fucking Ruth more than Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds is top five. Yes. Is Barry Bonds probably like you watch his swing. But And then you can say, well, Babe Ruth was facing Milkman. I get it, but Barry Bonds was on steroids. There, there's something that you can poke at with all of them. You're just so fighting a losing battle, right? I don't <laughs> care. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to fight it till the day I die because I believe in it. I, I don't like the... the I, and and I, I was even arguing with Aram that like his... His um, that you always take the modern player. And I'm like, all right, well, that makes the decision easy. Mike Trout's the best player of all time. There it is. Done. I know you've got uh, a theater background. I know your dad, um, well, your dad teaches theater at UCSB. Yeah, he's the chair of the theater department, went to Princeton, then went to, studied at Juilliard. And my grandma was actually, shout out my grandma, Libby Apple. She was the first woman chair of the Oregon, or the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, so I got a lot of theater in my background. I'm a performer. Yeah. I'm not a media yeah. personality. I'm a, you know what? I'm an actor. I'm not even a media guy. I'm an actor. That's what I'm going to call, start calling authentic. myself that. Hold on. What are you doing? That's not authentic. True. Yeah. Maybe right? I'm not an actor, but I think it's cooler. Like, what, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm an actor. Where do you act <laughs> no. on my phone? <laughs> I'm a TikTok star. <laughs> <laughs> you know, little huddy. That's me. That's the problem. Cause I'm not <laughs> acting. It's actually genuinely like I say, not right. gambling advice, but we all know that bit. I mean, I'm, freaking also did you just a, admit it on the pod no it's not gambling advice okay good, good, good. <laughs> um no so what i was going to say with that is like um what what you just got into is 
uh, I'm sure you took an improv class at some point, right? Doing the, <laughs> doing the yes. You never took an improv class? No, because um, I never got into acting like they did. I was always much more into sports while my sisters were um, in the theater. My sister is at San Diego State right now. She's the lead in the play, but they just found out that uh, first two weeks are still remote due to the Omer Krizzle. Omer Krizzle. The Omer Krizzle, as Snoop yeah, Dogg might a- say. Have a very Snoop Christmas. Um, yeah, so in improv classes, you, you can do an exercise that pretty much is just compounding yes and, and you got to keep on building and it never ends. Like it ends when the, when the teacher says stop. Um, somebody says something and you have to reply with yes and, and then build. And then they say yes and. Um, and and that's, that's the era conversation there. It, it never has to stop. The only way it stops is if one of you wants to go to bed. That's the only way that conversation halts. Uh, so I prefer <laughs> just to not talk about it. I know you and Arm are in the same boat. It's like, why even talk about it? I'm like, why talk about anything? Why talk about anything? Uh, I think it's listen, like the LeBron Jordan conversation. I could do a podcast every single day on no that way. shit. I no love way. it. Oh, gross. I'm obsessed with it. I have. Gross. Oh, I could watch. You know how much of a piece of shit I am? I could watch Stephen A and Skip Bayless argue over that or any of these guys. I eat it up and I can't tell you why. I just love it. I love this. That's why I love the Hall of Fame discussion so much because I love diving deep into the numbers, deciding who was better. I do like it and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, should we end the pod on that? <laughs> I don't know where to go. From well, what we should end the pod is that in our description, we have a new shirt hashtag bigger than baseball. And yes. we are donating all of the proceeds from the shirt. Plus we are matching up to $500 worth of sales where we are donating it to Kentucky and a lot of the charities down there in the South that were affected by the tornadoes. We are keeping close watch. We have multiple of our staff members down there in Kentucky helping out as well. We really want to make a push for this and to help those families during the holidays. So go check that through the link in our description. Also, um, after you get your bigger than baseball, I always say get that shirt before you dip into the not gambling advice shirt, which I am wearing right now, as well as just baseball hats, hoodies. We got it all. It's probably a good idea to get a hoodie right now. If, if, uh, but then again, with global warming in my uh, Santa Barbara might be the only place where it's actually raining. Yeah. yeah I don't think it's a good idea for me. I don't, I don't think I need a hoodie right now. I think I can get away with a hat, though. Yeah, thanks, um, Dick. Yeah, no problem. But, yeah, the bigger than baseball shirts, they're big time. Uh, we've got three guys in Lexington. Clay Snowden is a big Reds guy. Give him a follow. Um, Clay Snowden on Twitter. No, it's funny. Um, his, his name on Twitter is Clay, Clay underscore Reds, Reds which yeah, I love. Clay <laughs> underscore Reds, which is perfect. He just made his debut on the Just Baseball show earlier this week. It's phenomenal. Um, we, we played GM with the Reds, and they're so hard to they're so hard because they're hard. I mean, we've talked about them. Like they are in this purgatory. I didn't, I call the reds, the Portland trailblazers. Yeah. I think it's like kind of perfect. It's just, you, right. And it, you're so in the middle that if you go one way, like, do you tear it down? Do you just rebuild? Do you just retool? Do you just go all in? It's so impossible, but we it's went through impossible. it all. So go check out episode 123 of the just baseball show. Yeah. This is 124. And uh, yeah. Kendall McKee, uh, T Wright, they both uh, are big in the collectibles sphere and just baseball wild cards trading. If you want to, you know, get into the collectibles, give them a follow there. Um, yeah, I it, listen. That is uh, that's what you should be doing, right? If you if you feel like you could be in the giving mood, do it because it's all going there. So it's all going there. Um, also, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody. Yes, we are those psychos who records on a christmas eve and gives you a christmas eve we won't give you a christmas podcast but you could bet your ass we'll be back on monday and we're going to finish the hall of fame conversation we're going to fill out our ballot we're going to keep playing gm also you know what's kind of exciting i'm starting a new podcast not too sure of the name yet um might be doing some little fantasy might be doing a little gambling with colby olsen so stay tuned to hear about that it's not set in stone yet but i do want to give a little bit of a sneak peek oh oh 2022 thank you everybody